Hello, um, thank you so much for joining us for the first Skiddle and She Said So collaborative event. Um, we decided to partner for Promote Her, which is a new initiative basically all around inclusion in the promoter sphere. We initially did a survey around female and female identifying promoters. Um, we soon realized that those questions weren't as inclusive as inclusive as they should be so we're going to revisit that survey put another one out um, but for the time being we're going to look at the results of the initial survey um, so we'll have a look at those stats but first up I shall let these guys introduce themselves and who they work for. Hi um, I'm Saoirse I work on the in-house promotions team at Oval Space and Pickle Factory so that's running the logistics and looking after artists stuff like that so yeah that's me. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sabrina Ann. I um, run a media platform called Distinga, which is all about highlighting and um, showcasing emerging talents and new talents. And we throw a lot of parties throughout the years, um, <clears throat> which is all about just putting new emerging DJs into a space whereby they maybe would have never been um, booked before. So yeah, so I'm Sabrina, hello. Hey, I am Rainan Ikubia and I am the head of talent for Bordwick live who look after print works, drum sheds, a magazine, and a bunch of those venues. Hi, my name's Alice. Um, I do a few things. Um, I DJ and promote a night in Manchester called Meet Free, which is a techno night that I run with three other girls that we started about six years ago. Um, I also run a night in Manchester and Liverpool and Glasgow called Under One Roof, which is a rave for adults with learning disabilities. Um, and then I also run a talk series in Manchester called Floor Talks, which um, is similar to this kind of format, basically just um, bringing people together to actually talk about issues in music and kind of culture more broadly that need to be talked about. And I'm Becca and I work for Skiddle. Hello. Oui. Um, so the survey that we put out, some of the stats that we got back that were 94% said there are fewer female promoters than male promoters working within their music scene. So I kind of wanted to start with a wider question on why do we think that there's less inclusivity in the promoter sphere in general? Well, I, I'll start. <laughs> Um, well, it's, it's kind of a good one to kick off on, actually, because we started Meet Free about six years ago, um, and we started it. I have to be really careful when I like tell this story back in Manchester because other people are there who I'm talking about, but when we started it, it was quite, um, I don't know if it was the same in London, but quite like a bro techno kind of scene. Um, it was very, it was kind of the tail end of Sankey's. It was not really that enjoyable an atmosphere to go out in. Um, and I think for me, I had just moved to Manchester and the three girls that I run Meet Free with we're the same, we'd all just moved to Manchester and we all kind of thought, oh shit, like this isn't really what we expected. Um, it always felt a little bit aggy and you know, quite negative. And then we had the other side of things where we we're kind of all on the techno side of things and it was quite um snobby really more than anything. You know, a bit like, oh, if you hadn't heard like Aphex Twin, like xylophone solo from when he was four, like you just weren't like people weren't interested. So we were like, this kind of has to change. Um, so we thought, we initially joined a group of honestly about 14 other people to promote this one night, which is absolutely ridiculous. And it was an absolute disaster, as you can imagine. Um, but that kind of brought us together and made us realize, it kind of demystified that promotion scene a bit. Um, and maybe if we hadn't have done that, we wouldn't have got under the skin and behind the scenes of what promotion really is and actually realize, oh no, it's it's not some dark art, like we actually can do this. So we sacked off all the boys, no offense, um, and, and started Meat Free. Um, and we called it Meat Free because we were all girls and we had no meat and it was just a bit of a, a joke that went too far. Um, but it's kind of stuck. Um, and we started out with the intention of um, creating nights that felt really fun um, and they weren't too serious and they weren't too snobby and um, we did like, before it was cliche, we did like glitter and inflatables and things and we kind of did that just to sort of disarm people a bit because what we'd find was those dance floors were very serious and as I said, like a bit aggy and there was quite a bit of a tension in there. So we thought, well, if we make everyone look and feel like a dickhead, then everyone will feel the same way and we can like start to have some fun. So 
it was like kind of putting, you know, 140, 150 BPM techno artists alongside an inflatable Zimmer frame. And it worked. Um, and that was a really good way for us to kind of break in to um, to break into the industry a little bit um, and kind of break down those barriers. But I think it was when we first started, it was very apparent there weren't any other female promoters. And we didn't start out to be like a female promoter. But I think what organically happened was very different than what would have happened with a male promoter. And I was talking about this and something else recently. And we started out by doing pay what you want parties. And we were like, yeah, it's a really cool idea because people just come in, like, you know, you pay if you like it, stay, blah, blah, blah. And in hindsight, I realised, like, was that a bit apologetic? Like, we were like, oh, no, people won't pay. So I, I don't know if that was, like, a, a conscious or an unconscious thing, but at that time, we were certainly one of the only kind of female promoters in Manchester. Happy to say it's changed um, a lot now, but I think for us, without having that in with that big group of other promoters... Would we have felt confident to do it? Maybe not, because no one else was doing it at the time. I think um, the reason why I think there's less women that are promoters is just the culture of the club scene. Um, it was very much, obviously, girls would get done up to the nines to go out, and the boys would be the ones that are kind of facilitating the parties. And that's just something that's continued on. And I think only now um, it's changing. And with women coming to the forefront and taking the risk and wanting to be able to put on the parties themselves, it's now changing. But I think the reason why it's taken so long is because there's not enough women doing it. And I feel like women maybe in this day and age don't realise they can do that. And, you know, if you talk about the West End clubs and the scene there, it's all about the boy promoter going to get the pretty girls and put them on a table so that the guys that are spending the money, and that's the kind of culture of just life, but it's changing. So I think as things are changing, the fact that women will come involved will also change, but it's just going to take a time. I think it's important that we have promoters such as ourselves to be able to take those risks, to be able to open out those doors. So, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you that it is, it's a cultural thing, and I think the idea of representation is so underestimated because mentorship is such a cr like crucial, valuable thing. And to have an older brother or a friend who has experience already to show you, like, how do you hit up agents? How do you approach venues? How do you... All these fundamentals of putting on a party. If you don't have anyone to show you that, you're not going to have a clue. And I think... Um, I do think it's underestimated how scarce that is from woman to woman, and you know, I do think it, it's kind of a given when you have um, when you have guys. That's my opinion on that. And you talk about you know the West End and how a lot of people view that as a sexist culture, but I don't know how much better it is in the underground sometimes, to be honest. I pretty much what these guys said. <laughs> You're in the far end. <laughs> yeah, pretty pretty much what these guys said. I was. Yeah, pretty much what they said. <laughs> Sorted. Um, so if we look at the top, like, big-scale promoters, like, nationwide guys, you know, maybe even festival promoters, it is very much predominantly male. So say if we're looking at the grassroots and the independents, how do we get them up to that level? I know a little bit about this one. Um, so, again, it's a continuation of what these guys have said. <laughs> so basically, like... It, it's a culture thing, and the, and the culture has started to change. Probably, it, it, it would be unfair to say like six years ago, because obviously you got like chemistry and storm, who obviously started Melheads. So it, there has been a long running theme, but I think now as a nation, the culture is kind of, is changing, isn't it? It's becoming more open. I think with that change, we're starting to see more female agents come through. To this point, it has been a very male, white male middle class dominated you know area when it comes to sort of national promoters and agents to a degree but at the moment there's a lot of people coming through there's like Cheyenne at Metropolis there's also uh, Nicole at Coda there's also obviously Lucy at Coda there's, there's just there's a lot of, of females coming through at the moment I would say and um. Sasha, you mentioned before about having that sort of mentor 
um, figure in your life and how that can help you. And one of the main bits of feedback that we had from the survey is that um, they feel that if there was more role models, so to speak, that it might encourage a more diverse set of people to get involved. So how do we think that we can encourage that within the scene, having those sort of role models about... Um, I mean, something that we've done a lot of in Manchester and still happens um, was kind of open DJ lessons that were specifically um, for female, female-identified, non-binary. Um, and they always had a really big uptake. You know, people were always really keen to come. but um, And that was really good. And it's sometimes the more valuable part of it was just like having a chat on the side while someone was waiting to do it. And... I always laugh, like, I'm such, like, not a technical DJ, and people are like, how do you do this? And I'm like, mm, I don't know, like, let's just <laughs> figure it out. And one of the girls I meet, Free Lucy, she's, like, super technical, and she does, like, a really good, she does a really good slideshow, but we're all sitting in the back, like, God, yeah, she's right. Like, so we're all learning from each other as well, but at those things, it's almost not about just, it's not about being, like, the best technical person and passing on that. It's being able to, like, instill like a little bit of confidence in someone or when I, I grew up in Belfast and before I moved to Manchester I always worked in clubs and everything but like I never would have even dreamt of DJing because the people that were around me I would have thought they were boys at that time would have been like pfft, like absolutely no way am I teaching you and it was only when I came to Manchester and met the girls from Meat Free who already DJed that they were like oh yeah well, I'll show you and sometimes all it takes is someone to be like that's what this button does and that's what this button does. And you're like, oh, that's not so scary now. It's just like that one little barrier that's broken down. But I think with, I think like a lot of the talk and like rhetoric around this type of thing, it's always about DJing and producing. Like it's like a technical skill that you're passing on. And I think when it comes to something like promoting or being an agent or working in a venue, it's not as easy because there's not really, it's easy. Yeah, it's easy to say, here's a DJ workshop. It's not so easy to say, here's an artist liaison workshop. So I think it's good on one side, but on the other side, back behind the scenes, it's not really so easy. I think we need to scream and shout about people that are doing amazing things more. And that's one of the reasons why I built Distingo. It was a platform to showcase that there's other avenues within entertainment, within music, fashion, law, accountancy, whatever, that there's amazing people behind these scenes doing great things. And one of the things we do is we highlight people, we might highlight a promoter or a lawyer or whatever and showcase their story. I think things like this as well, panel talks where people are able to understand what goes on behind the scenes and hear how they can get into it, what it takes, what the job looks like is an also an opportunity for people to look at someone and be like, I I dig what she's saying or I like what he's saying. I want to be like them. And it's all about us just being able to scream and shout about each other. It's so easy in this day and age. You scream about a footballer, you scream about a DJ, an artist. Like, let's scream about the people that are actually helping those careers move forward because there's so many people behind the scenes all the time. Yeah, 100%. Like... I think that visibility is such a crucial thing and to be able to see someone. And I think if you're a white middle class guy and I work with loads of white middle class guys and they're really good at their job and they're, they're brilliant. Hey, white middle class guys, you're all great. Shout but, out Andrew Hill. <laughs> but I think there's something really valuable to be able to look at your team and see someone that looks like you and you can relate to and say, that's what I'm aiming for. And maybe that, I don't know if that sounds, if you can't relate to that, maybe that sounds like silly, I don't know, but, or like, or you should just be able to say it doesn't matter, but it, it does matter. So I totally agree with you that having platforms where you can just see people around you doing something that you can aim for is so important. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I would agree. I think. A platform is, is massive, and I think because if you don't, so if you can't see someone like you doing it, like you think you won't be able to do it, and then when you get in sort of those situations when you do get to like a SJM or a Metropolis or whatever, it you know it, it, it can be quite an intimidating thing if you're not if you're not comfortable and you know you're surrounded by these old sort of intimidating white dudes, like you know it can be quite an intimidating thing. So I think. Like having a platform where you know 
you can see people doing what you want to do and then getting that knowledge and then feel comfortable in what you're doing is very important. Um, if we rewind a little bit to campaigns maybe a couple of years ago, there was Smirnoff's Equalizer Music and also there was a pledge to make festival lineups a 50-50 split between female and male. Why do we think that it took so long for maybe those to, to launch in the grand scheme of things? Um, I think it's because not enough people see it as an issue yet. I think a lot of people think to themselves, well, I'm not sexist or I have loads of girl mates or I respect women. So if a girl wants to apply for a job or step forward for that opportunity, then she can go for it. But they don't realise that, like the issues that we've already touched upon so early on in this talk, like issues of visibility and issues of mentorship, and they don't realise that those are problems. And they're just like, I wouldn't block someone if they wanted to, but they're not yet realising how important it is to reach out to encourage someone that, in my opinion, positive discrimination is a really important thing, and maybe it's controversial, but I do think sometimes you should step past the people that get those opportunities all the time and reach and give, put a chance on someone that maybe doesn't. Yeah, it's almost like the, you can say, well, as you say, I wouldn't block someone, but you're also like not enabling someone. And I think you have to realise that you, if you are in any position of privilege that... You really need to recognise that and say that not everyone is. And if you're in that position, then you should be giving people a step up. But not everyone obviously sees it that way. But I think to just come back to your original question, I think it was just, it's like the worldwide culture shift. Like it took that long for Time's Up and Me Too and all that kind of stuff to come up. So it wasn't, it was like on one hand, people weren't recognising the need for it. On the other hand, the people that were in need didn't like yet have that voice. Like that voice wasn't like that collective voice wasn't like strong and together enough to make enough noise really. And I do think it's good, but again, I don't think it goes far enough in terms of like the front of the scenes, behind the scenes. And then I know, you know, we've already talked about the fact that this is the first of many um surveys that you'll do, but the, even those festivals that I've been to and it's like 50% male, 50% email, email and you're like, okay, great. And we were at one the other day. I was at a festival last weekend and I looked around and I was like, it's really nice, this festival. It's like super inclusive. And I was like, it's still really fucking white. <laughs> like, it is super white here. And hot, like, so what do you do? Do you say 25% black male, 25% white female? Like, how do you then do that? We need, I agree that, there is a need, especially in like when it comes to actual employment and things, but when it comes to creating like truly kind of intersectional culture and like platform people to just, because we're not just talking about people getting jobs, it's actually people feeling comfortable enough to go to a rave, essentially. So it's like, how do we build spaces that people feel comfortable with without actually having like a checkbox? Like, sorry, too many white girls in here, gotta go. <laughs> 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 Although I would like to do that sometimes. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Like how, I, you know, I don't have the answer, but... I think um, I have a bit of a, a pickle with this because sometimes things come across as tokenism and it seems like a lot of things are being done, like, oh, we're going to highlight women this month. And then it happens this month and then it just goes back to the same thing. Um, and it's a kind of um, double-edged sword because on one hand it's a great thing because it's being recognised and it's happening. However, I feel like it starts from the intent of why you're trying to push an initiative. And a lot of the times it is marketing. Oh, let's do this to market women and do this and at, um, attract this audience. And I think, like I said, it starts with intention. And if your intention is right from the beginning and your intention is to make an inclusive club night or event or promotion, then you will naturally do that because you will look at your lineup and just be like, it doesn't feel right. The same way if you were having like a mixed genre night. If you were trying to have a mixed genre night but it was all house music, well, you're not, you're not fixed, you're not kind of reaching where you're trying to go. So I feel like if you have that same intention with just wanting it to be very equal across race, sexes, um, music genres or whatever, you will actually just naturally do that. And the problem is, is that people don't care. They don't want to do it yet. So until we get the people in positions that want to make a difference, it will still always kind of have that kind of trickling kind of culture, unfortunately. But 
things are changing. I'm very positive about the change. <laughs> I think obviously, I, as a booker, day to day, I just book print works basically. So like, it's something I actively think about every week, every day, um, just because it's just something that I want to see. But in reality, it's like there's only a certain amount of DJs that are that are that are there at the moment. You know what I mean? Like like a Blash and Anna are playing print works, you know what I mean? Like every, everyone that, that you can get, I will get. <laughs> but at the moment, that talent is super limited. And at the moment, everybody in London wants them. Everybody wants Saoirse at RA. Everybody wants a Claire Fifi. Everybody wants, you know, these DJs. So it's like, it, 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 it's just going to take a little bit more time for another wave of sort of girls who are 16, 15 making music now to come through and it will balance out as we get further along the line. But like it, it's crazy at the moment, like trying to book Carista, you have to wait a year. She's like a she's a small DJ. She's not like a she's not a headliner, but because the demand is so crazy, you can't I can't book Carista to play print works, which is crazy for me. But it's good it's good to see the appetite and the demand is there, I guess. So that's just the way it is, I guess. I don't know. Um, so similarly with LGBTQ plus parties, they're getting a lot more visibility now, a lot more media coverage. You know, like RA Mixmag have run a lot of stuff on them this year. Why do we think that there's been a shift towards that recently? Like, why is it again taken so long for them to get sort of visibility that they deserve? I would say it's because you needed people brave enough to be able to push the scene in that type of way, um, and it always starts with one. And then they're usually very secretive type of parties that only kind of are um, promoted to that scene for a specific reason for safety. Because if you kind of made it worldwide or l let everybody know, you might get the wrong type of people in those spaces. But I think again, with the change of culture, um, everyone's becoming a little bit more open to different sexualities and things like that, which is now making it more of a desire to want to go and be in those spaces with that community. Um, and there's a bit of a pull and throw now because it's like people want to be involved in it, but the communities don't always want other people to be involved, which is like a hard kind of um, balance to make, which is understandable. But at the same time, if we, you can't want equality, but then not give it at the same time. But I think it's just literally down to the fact that there was people brave enough to push and really be bold with what they were doing, with the likes of Pussy Palaces and things like that. Like, they're bold. You go to a Pussy Palace party, you're having a good time. <laughs> like, straight, not, like, <laughs> by whatever you are, you will have a great time because their parties are just insane. And that's, what, and that's what it takes. If you kind of create something that people now want to be a part of, it will grow and become something that, oh, hold on, now the whole world wants to go Pussy Palace. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's um, even though we picked a name like Meat Free, which seems a bit stupid but compared to the point I'm about to say, but I read something recently and it was like, Meat Free, a, cle a queer leaning party. And I was like, ooh, are, are we? <laughs> like, <laughs> and it's um, the other three girls in Meat Free are all lesbian, but when we first started it, not everyone was out to the people that they worked with or not everyone, you know, so we, whereas for me, it was like, yeah, let's call it whatever because like, kind of like I'm straight, no skin off my nose. When it's someone else that's having a completely different experience of that, you know, they were very careful to be like, oh, like let, we don't want to call it a queer party because that's their own personal experiences coming through. So, which you have to respect as well. But as you say, it's like what you build unintentionally will, will come out. And that's what we did. You know, we didn't ever intentionally say like, this is a queer party, we're booking these people or we're doing these types of things. But the attitudes that we had amongst us as promoters and people obviously came to the forefront and it became a space that people felt very welcome um, and very, you know, we were open to anyone kind of coming. So, yeah, I agree. It's like what, it's what you build. It's, it's kind of like what you, what you put on, the way I see it is like what you put on the decks, what you put on your door is like what you put on your dance floor, essentially. So we're always quite specific about, like we never ever have... Um, like even like six years on, we still do the door. <laughs> like we still argue about like who's doing the rota of like shifts on the door, but it's so important because that's the first thing that people see. So they need to feel welcome. But 
I think in terms of the LGBT um, plus thing, it's especially in Manchester, it's like that's kind of what we're famous for, which is great. But there is a problem as well. Like when we just went Pride Weekend just passed, we were like, all right, time to make some money. Because you know, like all the corporates, all the big bars, all the clubs are going to kind of appropriate that culture. And in a way, it's like, well, yeah, let's rent some for it. But B, like, let's also not um, kind of fuel it. So there was one brand that will remain unnameless that um, kind of was putting together this panel and they'd asked us to DJ and be part of it. And they kind of were just throwing really flipping comments around about like, oh, let's get this person on a panel. Well, not this person, this type of person. And we kind of said, I was like, look, we have to pull them up on this. Like, we can't, like, we have to have our principles here. Like, I know it's a lot of money, but... And we kind of pushed back and said, look, what you've said is really out of turn, blah, blah, blah. And to be fair, the person, like, think, you know, they're just a bit rushed off their feet. They're not really thinking. And they did take the time to come back and say, like, I've read what you've said. I'm, like, I'm really sorry. I totally see where you're coming from. I was completely wrong. And then, you know, we worked with them to create something that actually was purposeful rather than just a, like, rainbow washing event. So I think that is the problem, too, that the culture has changed, that it's come more to the forefront. But... It's become quite cool as well, and it, it is really open season for people kind of taking it over then, and as you say, not kind of being able to guard those kind of safe and sacred spaces that people spent so long trying to build. Yeah, I mean, I would, like, add to that on, like, kind of a different, like, subject. Like, we were just talking together before the panel started that we feel like London's a safer place to go clubbing now, and maybe that's a controversial thing to say, but... And it's definitely London-centric. I can't comment on, you know, the rest of the country, but it feels like 15 years ago, 10 years ago, less. Like, London was uh, oftentimes dodgy, to, uh, you know, to put it lightly, to go clubbing. And maybe for the LGBT like, community, it was, it was dangerous. And now, with things being, you know, maybe things are less, like, raucous, they're less, like, hedonistic, maybe... But maybe they're safer, and maybe it's a lot easier for people to be open about the kind of night that it is. I would just ask you a quick question, Alice. Like you kind of touched on this idea that like maybe it's like kind of cool now to be like it's a queer party. Would you feel that y way? Yeah, uh, and I do think I think it's just becoming a bit of an issue, not for people who when it's at like the actual heart of what they're doing, but these other brands or like if you. Like, a couple of weekends ago, it was Manchester Pride, and, like, every... You would have made money, like, actually saying, I've got an underground street party going, because everything else... Everything else was so Pride. And there was a um, there was a bar that were really pushing it and thought, like, people that go... They're not going to go. Like, they don't go every other weekend, so they're not going to suddenly see that you've got this Pride party and start going. So people love just, like, jumping on the bandwagon, but... One of the reasons that I say that is because I think about a couple of other things. So we talk about gender, we talk about race, talk about sexuality. But for me, like the two things that are never ever talked about are disability and age. So it's like gender became, became quite cool. So as you say, it's like all female lineup this month or um, now people are, you know, really jumping on the pride bandwagon and things. But because I think disability and age aren't really that cool subjects, they're not really going to get the voice um, that they deserve. So that's why I use that terminology, because that's always something that's a, in the back of my mind. Obviously, with the Under One Roof, the party that I run, everyone thinks it's great, but like no one's going to start jumping on that bandwagon. Are they because it's a hassle and not every venue is, you know, yours is, but not everyone is accessible and things. So, and especially with age, like no one wants to talk about ageism, like it's just not a thing that we, and especially, I think, especially when you layer it with the gender thing. So if you're old and female in the industry, you're at the minute, you're kind of done. I think as a bloke, you can kind of be 50 and still rocking about, I like don't that's know. fine. It's, it's like Jay, what, Jay Ward is doing a bit. Yeah. yeah. You're struggling. <laughs> <laughs> you're struggling. Yeah, but yeah, that that's what I mean about the cool thing. Like I think that, the female thing and the LGBTQ thing, they've the culture has changed. Yeah. That wave has come about and people are not able to jump on it and it's it's good to do, but I think there's a lot of other elements or sections of intersectionality that just I don't know when they're gonna get their day, essentially. 
that's hopefully something that we can address in the future with, with other stuff we're involved with. But as maybe managers and agents, is there anything that you guys think they could do to maybe help make dance floors more inclusive? Uh, it's agents and managers, difficult one. Because I'm thinking about the agents and managers that I work with, and it's like, they're not saying, don't make my dance floor inclusive. You know what I mean? They're not, uh, they're not trying to go the opposite way. Is there things they can do to encourage it? I think it's more the promoters. I think, like, you know, house music w was born out of the gay scene. You know, it, it was a great, it, it is a great party. Like, and following that line through, you know, Pussy Palace, we mentioned them before, they're also in this panel. It's a sick party. And I think we kind of just have to encourage these parties that are really good, that do encourage, you know, all, all inclusive females and if it, the gay community as well. And I think that's, that's the key. Like if, if it becomes a thing, a tokenism thing, where it's like you're putting someone on because they're just gay or you're putting someone on because they're female and the party's crap, no one's going to come back. You know what I mean? That's just the way it is. So we, we kind of need to work, work out a way how we can, you know, retain that culture. I say we, it's more, you know, these guys, how you can retain that sort of culture that is female or gay and still have, you know, the party. And I think that will, that will push it forward, basically. Interesting. Yeah, like, the thing, like, I totally agree with you, because the thing is that agents represent people that are being booked already. It's not this idea that agents are like tastemakers. The fact is that they're not. The fact is that promoters are tastemakers and we're not doing our jobs well enough if we're not putting forth people who are really good at their jobs, being DJs, being artists, but also happen to be trans, also happen to be people of colour, also happen to be women or non-binary. We're not doing our jobs because they exist. They're out there. And the idea that... Um, oh, can't find any, so let's just book another, you know, mm. white guy playing techno again. It's bullshit. like, yeah, it's, it's not, we're not doing it's our bullshit. jobs properly. It's bullshit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got that, because there are, they are out there, and I think, if you just got, I think everyone can be guilty of being busy, but if, if you look, you'll find it. You know, like, I recently, which is shameful, I should, I should say this, but I found out about Eris Drew, you know what I mean? And, and like, she is amazing, you know what I mean? Like that level. And she's of DJ. been in the game for about yeah. 15 years now. She's not yeah. been, she's not just been like, oh, hi, I'm here and I'm a DJ and I'm trans. She's been about for ages. And who's paid attention? Nobody. Not very yeah, many people, yeah. especially yeah. outside of Midwest. I actually, actually have a story about that. So we, um, we booked Eris Drew last year and we were in the restaurant for like the artist meal beforehand and we're waiting for DVS one day arrive. Um, and she was like, oh, I feel a bit nervous. And I was thinking, God, why do you feel nervous? <laughs> like, I feel nervous. And she said, oh, the last time I saw him, like, was before my transition. And I was just like, Whoa. I was just actually floored by how brave you have to be to, like, put yourself in those situations. And if anyone's met her or seen her play or seen anything, like, she is the most, like, she's in another level of how like connected to music that she is like she's frightening like she's another being it's completely mental but she's yeah she's an incredible dj she's a wonderful person all those things but that was something and again it made me kind of check myself and be like wow like i never even because i just like wow you're like a famous dj oh you're trans that's cool but you don't think about like all the things that have to go into like giving someone the confidence, not only to be like a kid in the street to transition, but like someone that's in the public eye and actually had, you know, a career before the transition and wants a career after. And she's done so well. And that is because of her talent and her attitude. Like there's no doubt about that. But that interaction like totally floored me. The confidence and not even the confidence, the bravery that she had to actually do that. And of course, when DVS1 arrived, he was just like, hey, Iris, like, what's happening? Like, you know, there was no, there was, there was no, like, bump in the road. Um, and I hope she felt comfortable. But it, it, it made me really realize, like, you just do not understand someone else's experience 
in this world, let alone this industry. Can I say one more thing as well? It's like there's there's a, like a theme as well. If you look at like who's like actually doing the business at the moment, like Honey Dijon, Otto Otto, Eris Drew, it seems like that there there is a theme of of the of people just, just smashing it at the moment. So and that's just because they are being supported, you know, people are coming out to the shows. And I think we've, we've just got to continue that culture. If you see someone from the communities that you think is sick, buy a record, go to the party, basically. Yeah, and just to add like one more thing on top of that is this idea that like somebody isn't, somebody's just being tokenized. I know it's such a sensitive topic that you don't want to just be like, I'm just going to go see Eris you because it's the right thing to do. I mean, I don't think anyone says that, but just even the thought of that happening is like perpetuating this idea that people from certain demographics like inherently can't be good enough. Like women can be good enough. They are good enough. And so are people of color and so are non-binary people and queer people. Like they are good enough and it shouldn't be questioned. And you give the right people the platform, they will flourish and that's that. And that's what our job is in my opinion. Um, so moving forward, um, what do we think we can put in place to help support promoter inclusivity? I know some of the feedback from the survey was people might benefit from social media groups or platforms where they can engage. No, she said so is, is an amazing one to begin with. But what else do you think we can put in place to sort of improve the, you know, the issue that we've got? Um, there's just one thing when we were talking about managers and agents. Again, as you say, it's not it's kind of not really up to them. But I think sometimes when it comes to even venues or um, mostly just venues, I think if, if, if they, at the end of the day, everything comes down to money. Like everyone's doing it for the love, but you can't do it for the love if there's no money. Like everyone's putting on nights, everyone's DJing, everyone's selling records to make money and it has to be commercially viable at the end of the day. But I think if there was something um, I mean, isn't it RA who are doing like the promoter um, like loans or something? You can't say that name here, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <coughs> or, but I mean, things like that basically, at the end of the day, it's about money. And if there's support from people like Smirnoff who are doing the equalizing music thing, I think it needs to be a bit more practical sometimes. So if it's like, look, I want to put on this night, but it is going to be a risk because it's not a white guy that's playing techno, that's been playing techno here for like the past six months. It's these different people that you probably haven't heard of because they don't actually have the money to promote themselves or they don't have the voice to promote themselves or they've not had the platform to get here or you know because of all these grassroots things. But I've actually found out about them and I think, as you say, I think they're sick. So can you maybe like waive the venue fee for tonight because you might take a loss, but like, you'll be the hero of the day when they become big. So it's trying to, trying to like equalize, you know, we're talking about equalizing music, but we do kind of need to equalize money a little bit to make sure these things happen. I totally agree with what Alice is saying. And I got an opportunity to be able to get into promotions because the venue I was working with at the time, I was working with um, um, the Mama Group. And they, I went to them and I said, look, I really want to put this event on. And they were like, yeah, you can. There's no charge on the venue. Um, you just need to try and aim to hit this bar spend. It doesn't matter if you don't, but that's what will keep you being able to continue putting on your events. And I was like, oh my God, seriously? So I can actually just throw the event for free and not have to pay anything. And that goes a long way. And I think it takes venues, as you said, to recognize people that they can see can potentially do something and take the risk and that's what happened with me and I was able to you know grow from there and it and it just takes again when the intention is right if a, if you've got a good venue promoter that really wants to open out the opportunities to a different wider audience um speaking to her she, she said as well like oh like I just want to put on more events that aren't house because it's always house so she's recognized the fact that there's a there's a niche there that she wants to try and move into so I think if more venue promoters go in that lane it will make so much more difference and you know when someone new comes along don't say to them oh well it's a thousand pounds because they're not going to have a thousand pounds so take the chance because it's probably likely give them a Thursday night you're not going to have anyone coming in on Thursday anyway so give them the opportunity to do something and prove themselves 
the problem is that the people that have a thousand pounds are the white middle class mm-hmm. guys. I, I, th- I think you got to you got to remember as well. Like I'm, I'm looking at is Miguel here? Is he here somewhere? He's gone outside. He's the booker here, but he was the booker at the Nest, and you know that was a club, and they lost a lot of money. You know what I mean? It's not. I understand what what everyone's saying, but I've been a promoter for like just that's the only thing I've done, and like if you as a venue, if you lose money, you you know you could lose your job essentially. But at the same breath, if you're talking about giving out a Thursday, that is a hundred percent doable. And I know that's 100% doable because you pay for your venue with a Friday and Saturday, basically. So there, there, there is, I think, I guess it's, it, it's about balance. Yeah. What are you saying, Sersha? I don't know, it's such a difficult one because it is a deal that we do with promoters that we trust and believe in, but you have you, to find the right You've got an expensive people. venue hire as well. I know <laughs> that for a fact. <laughs> I mean, it's something that you can do with smaller clubs for sure. And it was something, again, we were talking about before um, we started the panel, this idea that there's so many big, massive capacity clubs opening. And those kind of clubs can't go out on a whim for people. Like, it's just not possible at all. Like, a first, like, an up-and-coming promoter is not going to fill a venue that's a 1,000 capacity. It's not going to happen, no matter how many mates they bring down, no matter how connected they are, it's not going to happen. Because your mates never show up in the end. Mates <laughs> never show up. <laughs> <laughs> but if you've got a 200 capacity venue, or, you know, if you're lucky and it's less, it is something that you can achieve. Um, but you do have to find the right promoter, of course. Ev- everybody loves to think... I'll throw an amazing party. It'll be the best party that this club has ever seen. But if someone doesn't have a track rock record, how are you supposed to know that? So, of course, it's always the gamble, but clubs are like... It sounds cliche, but clubs are nothing without really decent promoters. And that relationship obviously has to be established. I mean, you know this. Yeah, this relationship has to be established. It's just that's the skill, isn't it? That's what makes or breaks a venue staying open or not. I, I think one thing I, I'd... Ha- ha- how can we build for a better future, essentially? It's like anything. It's like when dubstep came, you know, it went from a minority thing to a mass market thing. And I think it's about, you know, female and the sort of open sexual culture is having a moment. And I think that's our job to make it mass market on a bigger scale. So that, again, I I said it before, but you just have to support the parties, you have to support the labels, you have to support the artists, and they'll get big enough. Like, you'll start in a small venue, like, I, I've seen it so many times, like, you put more grab in a 200 cap venue, people like him, he goes to a 500 cap venue, you go to a 1,000 cap venue, then you're at a 3,000 cap venue, and that will happen with this, it'll happen with female DJs, it'll happen with gay DJs and musicians too. We just have to support them. Cool. I think that's a really good place to finish. But if you guys have got any questions, feel free to send them that way. Anyone? We spoke quite a lot about house and techno and those sorts of clubs. And I know it's going to be different for your specialities. But what about supporting people in like the live sector? Because I've done quite a lot of live shows with friends and stuff. And sometimes it's really difficult to find, like, I don't know, an openly gay DJ that wants to play trap or rap music and or like be a warm up that sort of thing. And it's quite difficult to find those people and not be no, there, there's a select few. You know when people go select few, you want to find those new people and that's quite difficult. So people like ideas and how to support more the live acts of rather than house and techno. I think in house and techno it's almost like a given because it's the, there's quite a lot of history there. But in like rap where I want this stuff, it's like it's quite You'll be surprised in those cultures of music as well. There is still a lot of people interested, and there's a lot of people within those spaces who are um, their sexual their sexuality is different, or their their they're genderless or all those kind of things. So they are there, and it's just about finding them. And I think if you personally don't know who they are find someone that you know who does, because they are definitely there. I know loads of people, for example, that are in that space, so you can come and speak to me, I can give you loads of people. 
<laughs> so yeah, so they are there and it's just about, and that's something people need to realize. If you don't know something, but you want to do something, find somebody that knows because there is somebody that definitely knows. Everyone's culture is different. So if you are not um, uh, an expert in this field, there is somebody that is. And for example, in the rap, the grime or whatever, go to a person of color, they will 100% know. It's as simple as that. And that's what a, pe a lot of people forget to do. Um, they will go to the next friend or the next person that they know that are working on the same levels and not thinking, do you know what? That friend that I had at school, she's into this stuff. She's not quite here, but she will definitely know. So go to the people within the, those cultures that you want to help or put on and they will 100% have the answers for you. I 100% agree. That's like how I book any genre literally you just you, like if you I, I I'm not a huge techno fan I like it but I don't know a lot of it I ask people that like it you know what I mean it, it's just what you got to do sorry and just on that I think it's a really important thing that you say because I think whilst we're kind of like navigating this like new these new waves of culture and like different people come into the forefront and not like I think everyone ex expects everyone to have the answers and I think one of the biggest problems and that one of the biggest obstacles is that people are like afraid to ask or afraid to make a mistake or afraid to say like hey you're a black person can I ask you a black question <laughs> like and people think they're going to offend people so thank you <laughs> but people think they're going to offend people and I think that this like I'm okay it's mostly on social media like if you say the wrong thing or you say something out of turn it's not yeah, a lot of people are just idiots, ignorant, blah, blah, blah. But often, like, someone has just made a genuine mistake, and then if they get shot down in social media, they will not ask it again, and then the conversation is closed. In order to keep things moving forward, you have to ask questions. Yeah. Have to ask, you have to make mistakes. And it's okay to, like, if you don't know, just say to someone, can I just ask you, like, what is your preferred pronoun? Because I'm not sure. Or people will be probably more grateful that you've actually taken the time to ask them and just shied away from it obviously don't be boisterous and be like a dickhead about it but I think if you're courteous and you're um you're authentic and you're genuine in your questioning like your quest for knowledge of the next thing then I think that for me is the way forward and at the minute it's a huge obstacle this whole language thing that people think they're getting wrong can I ask these guys a question of course what so what do you feel about so DJs and musicians who have like done something wildly inappropriate to a female or someone who is, you know, gay, do they have a route back or what, 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 how do you feel about those, those guys? I feel like it's a, it's definitely a personal question for me because I've been on, I've been on the side of DJs being disrespectful at work and it's a very difficult thing to navigate because at the moment as Alice has sort of touched upon, there's no real way of dealing with when somebody steps out, when ste somebody steps out of line. Um, for me, I'm not sure how I feel about it when it happens in a party environment, but it happens so much in a professional environment where the lines are blurred, when people are not sure if they're partying with you or if they're working with you, and frankly, their behavior would be wrong either way, but because it's in a professional setting, it should be dealt with in a professional manner, but people are too scared to do it. So people sweep it under the rug. People aren't willing to deal with it as if you made some other professional blunder. Th to answer your question, is there a route back? I feel if somebody was genuinely ready to be apologetic and show that they were ready to change, then... Of course, I think that people should be uh, like in any kind of blunder, but I also feel like there are so many amazing DJs out there and it, the competition is so tight. I don't understand why we keep bringing back people that have made, frankly, horrible mistakes. They've gone on Twitter and they've been really racist or they've touched yeah, when up you a like girl really should know when better. they're working. And it's like, I don't understand why we need to keep giving those people opportunities when you can give them to other people. Yeah, I mean, I think you've raised like a massive point as well because there's two sides of the industry so much like there's the green room and the after party 
And then there's the Mix Mag article or the Skittle panel. And it's so, so different. Like, we all know that. And you're so right. You just, it's so hard to know what that boundary is. And I think for me, someone like who, who runs parties and promotes and it's not my full-time job, I feel like I'm in a position where I can say no, like stick to your principles and say to someone, that is wrong, that is out of line. You know, you can do it, but not everyone can do it. And it's the same as being in like, you know, a boardroom when someone says something wrong. It's, it's always those behind closed door things, but there have been quite a few high profile, obviously, cases um, of people, you know, doing or saying the wrong thing. I think if someone literally creates an artwork for their EP that objectifies women, like, there's not really much coming back from that because that is so purposeful, it's so intentful, it's so misjudged, and it's so... It's just wrong, and they can't do it. If it's a case where someone who has a substance abuse problem, which most people... Well, not most, a lot of people in the industry do, and they've been at an after-party and done some really bad things and really hurt a lot of people, it's like you say, well... It's hard when someone's under the influence because is that their true feelings? Is that their true intentions? Or have they just... I mean, drugs are a mind-altering substance, so can you truly blame someone if they are authentic and genuine in their apology? Can they come back? It, it's, it's really hard. It has to be on a case-by-case, case, but if you just go on Twitter and like say something racist, then no. Yeah, I like agree that it has to be it has to be dealt with sensitively. I don't think anything can just be like let's just deal with all of these things the same because there's different. It varies in in sort of seriousness and like what happened and what the true nature of intent was. I kind of think if we all party as part of our jobs, I assume. Um, and you have to keep you have to you know, hold it together, it's, it's your job. And to think that DJs or artists get a free card to not do that, I think is, da is dangerous. I, I think it's like, if I go to work and I can have a couple of beers, but I still have to do my job, then the DJ can do their job too. And they cannot be grabbing girls and saying, and saying <laughs> dirty things. I agree. You should be able to do that. <laughs> I, I agree. I think examples of people doing the wrong thing need to be made. Otherwise, it just perpetuates the same culture to keep happening. Um, there is cases whereby some people do make a genuine mistake. And if you make a mistake and you, you know, you put your hands up and you sh and you s and you're genuinely apologetic, then that's fine. Also, people's views change on certain things. We have to remember five, ten years ago there were so many homophobic people because they just didn't understand. Now, those same people would be like, do you know what? I'm really annoyed with myself back then. But the reality is they didn't understand it, so they saw it as something completely different. And so you, we have to also appreciate when people recognise their wrongs and they're sorry for them, and we have to appreciate when people can do that because that actually um, shifts for other people to realise, you know what, I also felt like they did, but I don't feel like that anymore. Coming from the hip-hop world, men have been objectifying women ridiculously for years and even still doing it now. And it's still it's because they still haven't got to a mental state where they realise this is not OK. So there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of letting people know that there's changes that need to be made. But if you literally just kind of shut people down and you don't actually have the conversations as to why people felt like that in the first place and actually explain through, it will never get anywhere. Yeah, I should have been looking at you, but... <laughs> thank you all. Yeah. Um, we're a little bit pushed for time, so I'll wrap it up there, but thank you guys so much. You're amazing, and thank you all for coming. <laughs> oh, and there's, there's free pizza in, like, half an hour? Lovely. Now? So, free pizza. Thanks, Skiddle, when she said so, for pizzas. Real? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.